Okay, so um, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Uh, Nicole and I are VIPs in this session, so we'll be in the background just making sure that people can get into the room and that there's no uh, technical questions or anything like that. You have tech support on the line as well. Um, remember, this session is being simultaneously interpreted in both English and in French, so you are welcome to speak in the language of your choice. Uh, we just ask that you, as best as possible, yeah, speak up so that the interpreters can hear you. All right, I am going to mute my line and I'm gonna let people into the room, Steve, and then it'll be, uh, we'll, we'll let you just uh, take it from the top and introduce yourself in the panel. And then as soon as you're done at the end, uh, Nicole and I will come back online. Perfect, so I okay. start sharing my screen right now. Um, sure, I think you might as well. That'll just announce to everybody uh, what's uh, what's happening. I think you can go right ahead and uh, and uh, they'll just see you at first. Great. Okay, everybody, we're going to let everybody in. Okay. Might want to put on a presentation, uh, Steve. Yeah. yeah. Oh, just a second. Just a second. Oh. Yeah, I'll wait until you're ready. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. Perfect. So, welcome everybody. Uh, oh, hold on. They're just coming okay. into the room still. Okay, sorry. That's all right. I would just give it 30 seconds or so. Okay. Welcome everyone who's entering and joining us. Welcome, welcome. Get you all settled and uh, and then we will begin our closing plenary session. So, so just let me know because I don't see anything except my slides right now. Uh, yes. We've got 50 people with us and we're ready to go, Dr. Pavanche. Okay, so every, uh, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon um, on this, for this session on, on new and emerging research uh, in uh, PH. It, uh, it, it is also my pleasure to uh, uh, present the panelists of the, the meetings, Dr. Sebastien Bonnet from Quebec, Dr. Nathan Bruner from Vancouver, Dr. Susanna Mack from Toronto and Dr. Duncan Stewart from Ottawa. So the, as you know, the session is meant to be, to be, uh, uh, you know, for questions, especially for 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 patients and and, and their uh, families. So um, I'll just introduce uh, some concepts of research, and then the panelists will be there to answer your question thereafter. So. Donc, alors, comme vous le savez, la, les traitements de l'hypertension pulmonaire ont changé de façon dramatique au cours des. So th this has changed in the last years. Uh, there's uh, we have uh, not mu uh, much to uh, offer to uh, the HDP uh, uh, oxygen and often uh, too often transplants, uh, pulmonary transplants are, are difficult. But uh, fortunately, we have uh, many different treatments in the last uh, few years. Ten different treatments uh, are available in Canada to treat uh, the HDP. that markedly improve um, the survival of PH patients. For example, if we uh, remind our, ourselves, or it was before the, you know, in the 90s, essentially, if you look at this survival, survival curve, with at the beginning, at the time of diagnosis, 100 of the patients, of course, being alive, you could see that over time, many patients were um, dying over time. So after two and a half years or, or so, Essentially, half of the patients were dead at that time. So a very deadly disease. Hopefully, with current therapies, things have improved quite a bit. With uh, the, This is nowadays uh, survival curve with a three-year uh, chance of being still alive, being about more than 80%, even more than 90% in the idiopathic form of pH. So this is much better than it was. So that's, that, that leads uh, patients at a stage where patients may hope that they, they will be that they will live uh, for a long time. Nonetheless, this is way from being perfect because uh, still nowadays too many people die of, of, of pH, and even those who survive, um, most of them do have persistent symptoms and even handicap uh, from from pH. Et en fait, la seule façon d'améliorer les choses. The only way to improve things is through research, of course, and we have to understand that the therapies that we have right now available in Canada are the fruit of research, and so that these uh, research are the fruits of discoveries that have been uh, done in a laboratory um, 15 to 20 years ago, and this brought uh, 
trials in clinic where we test these new medications uh, that have uh, patients that have HCP. It's a long process uh, for uh, the patients that have pH. And between the discovery, initial discovery in the laboratory on cells and animals and, and to the realization of cl clinical trials at two and phase two and three, they can show the uh, effectiveness and the security of uh, using medication and the approval of uh, Santé Canada, uh, Health Canada are, are really long. We have to understand that uh, it can seem too long, it can seem discouraging, but you have to understand that the studying uh, research is a continued study and keeps moving forward. And even though these clinical trials in the last years, even though the new therapies, uh, researchers have not uh, tried to continue discovering new uh, treatments in the last years, we've clearly uh, acquired uh, other uh, consequences and uh, knowledge, should I say, that permits us to understand better what is uh, pH and those knowledge is already translated in uh, clinical trials and being tried right now to develop uh, treatments for the future. And these research and laboratory have permitted us to understand the treatments that we have right now that are effective. And it is a little part to of the mechanism that is really complex that brings to the development of uh, pH. And it's these uh, new uh, cells that were discovered in the last 10-15 uh, years uh, are already part of uh, uh, clinical trials uh, uh, on humans. Uh, already being tested in humans and in fact there are several uh, clinical trials currently ongoing in pH targeting uh, several pathways. For example, this is one single pathway, new therapeutic target that is, that is being uh, targeted in clinical trials right now with each line uh, corresponding to one clinical trial that is currently ongoing. But of course, these are not the only clinical trials that are currently ongoing. There are very um, many other clinical trials currently ongoing worldwide as well as in Canada. So just to give you an not an exhaustive list of the clinical trials that are ongoing currently in Canada. Many of them are um, there right now with the aim, so I don't want to go through all this in details, but with the aim of with, to, to develop future therapies to further improve um, uh, the, 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 the life of pH patients. And even if those targets are currently under investigation in clinical trials, this does not stop researchers to try to find future therapies as well. Um, so currently, researchers keep going, trying to find new therapeutic targets that will eventually lead to new clinical trials and um, new treatment for new treatments for, for pH. Évidemment, on pourrait imaginer que, comme l'HTAP, c'est une... Obviously, as we know, pH is rare and uh, orphan uh, um, sickness. It is really limited uh, research but uh... pH is quite impressive. Just to give you an idea, we use as researchers many tools to have a look at the scientific um, publications on polymer hypertension, for example, and we frequently use PubMed. This is publicly available. You could go and, and look at this. Pub, PubMed will help you to find all the public uh, um, public, uh, all the scientific publications that are related to a specific subject that, that have been published over the last century or so. For example, if you type pulmonary hypertension, you will see, for example, this title. This title represents an article, and each article um, represents results of experiments made on cells, animals, humans, with the aim of improving knowledge, but ultimately improving patients' life and survival. But in fact, if you type pulmonary hypertension, for instance, you will see pages and pages of articles made on that. And in fact, if you have a look at all the publications that have been made on PAH, you could see that the number of publications just increased exponentially over the last two decades, with more than 70,000 publications in 2021 that have been made on pulmonary hypertension, uh, representing an exceptional interest in, in research in, in PAH. So I'll stop there. Je vais cesser uh, ici maintenant. I will stop here and give place to our other panelists, uh, Dr. Bonnet uh, from Quebec, uh, Bruner from Vancouver, Mac de Toronto, uh, Dr. Stewart uh, d'Ottawa. I will propose to start uh, by a few small questions uh, and I will ask them and afterwards uh, the session will be open for your questions and 
be there to answer your questions. I uh, will try to uh, share the screen. I would like to ask your panelists is what do you perceive as the most impressive advances in PH research that you've seen in recent years? I don't know who, want, who wants to start. <laughs> Perhaps I could I could ask uh, Duncan. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yes, yeah, it, it, it actually is a difficult question. There's been so many, and of course, we're all focused on our fields, right? So, so you want if you think, I mean, I think the identification. So it's not so recent, mind you, but the the uh, the mutations that are responsible for pH. What was a breakthrough for sure? Now it's a, a while ago, but we we continue to find more mutations that are contributing to this disease, although they account for smaller and smaller numbers of patients, I guess. But still, I think you get a, a tremendous mechanistic insight into what's going on. So that, that that's been really important. I, you know, as yet though, it, it really hasn't translated into uh, a uh, a novel, very effective therapy. But I I think there's hope for that. A couple of as you know, a couple of of, um, of studies which are ongoing that, that may may uh, result in that kind of breakthrough. So, so I think I think that would be be, uh, be my answer to that question. Sebastian, what, what do you think? Well, <clears throat> I agree with uh, what Duncan just said, but I, I will say that uh, despite a better understanding of the disease, uh, the current drugs that we are using are always targeting the same pathways. So I think the most uh, amazing progress that we made is the combination therapy. Combining these drugs all together from a clinical perspective, I, I think has totally changed the game uh, from over the past 10 years. I think now upfront combination therapy for patients are, you know, it's amazing uh, in terms of survival, quality of life and everything. Um, and I think uh, the future looks brighter, like uh, Duncan said, because of the understanding that we are uh, getting more every day on the disease. So I think uh, the future is looking bright in terms of new medication uh, that will be adding to the current uh, standard of care. But I think combination therapy has, was the game changer over the past 10 years in terms of clinical perspective. <clears throat> Su Susanna? Hi, Steve. Hi, guys. Hi. Nice to see everyone uh, on this beautiful day. Um, yeah, so I think uh, my vantage point on it is as, um, uh, so not like Nathan, as you guys know, I do a lot of the endpoint measurements, both uh, for some of the trials done in Toronto and then just in the course of clinical care. And I do think, I agree with uh, Seb that for sure, since uh, dual therapy or, or um you know, combination therapy has come, you know, what is quite gratifying is to see how much improvement there is. You know, I see them when they're first diagnosed and they're pretty, you know, they've often been symptomatic for a couple of years. Um, and they're just very grateful when they, uh, I've never seen anybody so grateful to have a procedure <laughs> um, when we can make a, a diagnosis. And then the next time we see them, you know, it's a very, very gratifying to see how much better they are so that the impact on quality of life is clearly evident from somebody who sees them only intermittently. What I think for us as clinicians and people who do these procedures, we're very mindful, I think, too, of the um, of the need for repeated procedures as well. So I think another aspect of um, care going forward um, you know, I think that you and Duncan and uh, make these great discoveries, right? You figure out pathways and you figure out new therapies. Um, and I think that translates obviously to uh, patient population who are benefiting from these therapies. But at the same time, I've, th there's no population um, who has as many cardiac procedures you know, on a repeated basis. The only other population like that is a heart transplant population, which I know Nathan and I also deal with. And, you know, one thing that that's led us to, I think, is a lot more um, attention being paid to the quality with which we actually do these types of measurements, right? And so there's another aspect um, that goes along with some of the breakthroughs you guys have made is, I think, in the improvement in how we actually understand measurement in earlier detection 
and of actually hoping to uh, continue to obtain high quality information. As a lot of you know that, um, you know, we're very mindful that we're doing an invasive procedure with some risk, um, you know, and all patients, that's what they have in common. They have to undergo these procedures. And we'd like to make those procedures as safe as possible and also as useful as possible, right? So improving the quality with which we gather information has been a real movement for us in the last few years. And I hope that translates also to better care for patients. So um, I, I hold out hope that, um, you know, new therapies are just around the corner, novel therapies, therapies not targeting the, the same three old pathways. Um, I, I think it's just a matter of finding the right drugs. And uh, I'm encouraged by um, what I find very encouraging uh, is the, the international collaboration that's been seen to the point where we can do um, these large multi-center trials that look at um, valuable clinical endpoints, not just six minute walk distance, but um, endpoints that actually matter, uh, mortality, lung transplant, um, hospital admission for PAH. I'm, I'm encouraged by the, the greater quality of the science that's coming out from a clinical perspective. And I am I'm proud that, that together we've created a national registry uh, that um, we're going to now use to develop publications from a Canadian perspective, looking at our own specific um, population with pulmonary hypertension. And um, we've already gotten some publications out there at our institution, and, and um, it, it's time that we, we had you know, uh, uh, to get m more of the Canadian experience with pulmonary hypertension out um, in, in publication. And, and I'm looking forward to doing that in the coming year. Thank, thank you all. Um, we, we, as I said before, we now have uh, several therapies right now. Um, and the uh, next step is to find new ones. Uh, so what are the main challenges that you see in identifying new targets or developing new treatments for PH? So, so maybe I'll, I'll lead off again. So I, I think it's the flip side of the last question. It's, it's, it's what we still don't know. So I think, uh, you know, we're, we, we can only design therapies based on, on our understanding of this complicated disease. And I, and I think that's not, you know, we don't, we certainly don't have a full understanding yet. We've got, I think, we're filling in the blanks. We've got some really good advances some really great ideas. But uh, but I think, uh, you know, at least my hope is, uh, as Nathan said, that it's not so long from now, just around the corner, that the pieces will fall into place uh, and it'll become much more obvious how we have to target this disease. And some of this may already, you know, we, we, we have some good hypotheses now and there are trials ongoing right now testing those hypotheses. So you know, a home run would really take us a long way if one of these uh, new agents sort of uh, uh, um, basically provided what, you know, something like a cure for this disease, well, we'd be done. But my guess is we still need to figure out a little bit more uh, and uh, to, to really understand how it is that we can best manage, manage this very challenging disease. Anyone, anyone else wants to, rest, to answer to that? Je veux bien. Je veux, je, je veux la faire en français. Okay. Uh, Celle-là. I will do this one in French, I think. I think that the, the side that is more difficult uh, to develop a new medication will be to the compare it with the, the actual, the, the existing uh, medicine, the effectiveness uh, of the combinations of medications uh, that are used now are so uh, appreciable that the, to develop a new medication in addition to uh, those other medications will be able uh, in the clinics to show a certain effectiveness, uh, a new challenge, I believe. I think that uh, we will need to see the way we will do these uh, uh, studies in clinic uh, uh, to not go beside m certain molecules that are really important because they, they won't have shown effectiveness uh, as it is required in the clinical trials. So I think that we probably have to rethink of improving and changing the way of the clinical trials are conducted to give a chance to the new medications uh, that are in development in terms of research. So it's a, a beautiful challenge uh, to, to go get it to, for the clinicians. Uh, we'll have to be creative, uh, uh, we will say. Bon. Oh. Uh, let's go uh, perhaps uh, Nathan first and Susanna after. 
Thanks. Um, so it's such a rare condition. And, you know, the more we look into it, the more we realize that, that even within pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, there's so much variability. And um, the, the challenge really is the fact it's rare and, and the fact that that um, it's be given the variability within it, um, it's it's tough to find a therapy that fits everybody and works for everybody. And I think a lot of it's going to be, it's, as as Dr. Stewart said earlier, identifying the right population, the right gene, the right gene, uh, the the right target. Um, and um, I, uh, I again, I hold a lot of hope for uh, for um, that we'll, we'll we'll be able to treat different subsets of PAH. Um, you know, uh, as time goes on in the next few years. Susanna. Yeah, no, I agree with what's been said. And we actually discussed this a little bit at the think tank of how to get more creative in terms of um, trialing what will be hopefully, you know, multiple medications that, as Nathan said, um, are the right combination for the right patient. Um, it will demand a little bit of creativity in how we test uh, these kinds of agents, so traditional clinical trials uh, in patients uh, is, is a bit challenging in a disease with a smaller population. I think the other thing I would, um, you know, another uh, area to, to think about is earlier detection. I think we have a much better appreciation, you know, just in the last several years, um, we now have a greater appreciation of, um, of, of some of the implications, even of very, very mild pH, you know, as, as most of the crowd knows, even the very definition of pulmonary hypertension, at least from the point of view of just measuring a pressure, has changed over the last couple of years. And our threshold for calling something pulmonary hypertension has dropped substantially. And in fact, uh, I think that um, the people are symptomatic far long, long before we can actually detect with our the tools that we currently use, which are really relatively crude. So I think another sort of big challenge going forward is earlier detection, particularly in populations, you know, that we know have risk, like patients with connective tissue disease. There's uh, got to be a better way, right, um, and an earlier way to detect disease. Thank you, um, Duncan and Nathan. We're talking about the good treatment for the the good patients and. Uh, was wondering other uh, other fields in, in medicine have made significant advances in regards to precision or personalized medicine. Um, have you seen any development uh, in pH and how do you see the future of, of, of uh, personalized medicine in, in pH? Yeah, I, I think it's it's um, uh, we're a little behind perhaps cancer and some other areas where this is now uh, the, you know the the uh, the um, de rigueur, this is how it's being done, uh, and this is how you deliver the best therapy. I think it's partly because, again, we don't have uh, the biomarkers or the uh, that we need or the signals that we need to really understand uh, different groups that we're beginning. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I think um, there's been some interesting, uh, uh, again, in the, in the research side, uh, some therapies, I'm thinking here about metabolic therapies and the work that Evangelist McLacus has done, being able to identify patients that have certain SNPs of genetic variants in, in, in important pathways that regulate this, and 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 they 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 seem to be more likely to respond. So, um, I think that's what we really need. And again, as we have a profusion of new therapies coming in, as as um, as Nathan uh, uh, and uh, and Seb pointed out, it's going to be challenging to you know to figure out uh, which therapies are best for our patients and I think heart failure is well into this now and we may need to uh, figure out ways that we can we can identify patients that respond to certain kinds of therapies as so personalized medicine so so that's an area I think we need to do a lot more in uh, but as we understand more of the molecular mechanism and it may be that it's not one molecular mechanism it actually is a number of different ways to get to the same place and and and, and if that's the case then we'll be able to figure out you know, if you got your disease through this pathway, then this may be the best therapy for you. Uh, so that's the hope that, uh, that we'll be able to do that. Other comments? Other. I'd, make, I'd make one other comment about what, what Susanna said, and I think it's really important, uh, is, is that we, when patients come to our, come to our attention with, with, with symptoms and shortness of breath and signs of pulmonary hypertension, 
they're already well advanced in their disease. Um, mm. And, and uh, you know, from a physiological point of view, before your pressures go up, you, you've got to lose the majority of uh, functional microcirculation. So, so, uh, so again, this is another reason why we need to find biomarkers or early warning signals, because I think we may have years or, or perhaps even longer um, uh, to try to, to prevent the disease from manifesting in patients that are already beginning to have the process that will lead to pulmonary hypertension, but we need to identify them because it may be many years later that they actually develop the disease, but by then a lot of the damage has been done. So, so again, that's another challenge for us going forward. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that you've got some audience questions in the chat box. Okay, if you perfect. To take a look there. Okay. Um, if you want to scroll up to Jane, that would be the first one. Okay, Jane. Okay, I just try to the press. Okay, She's asking so about so yeah, so so uh, Jane is asking about um, the Sapphire trial. So I don't know if if Duncan, you could comment on how it is going. Any updates on, on, on the trial? Thank you very much for the question and the interest. You know, uh, it, it was going really well until COVID hit. We were really uh, really firing on all cylinders. Obviously, uh, the pandemic meant that we had to most sites we didn't we didn't uh, close the trial down but we had to um, respect the uh, local decisions of public health authorities and hospitals and pro provinces as to what they were going to do and the vast majority of sites had to pause the trial because of the pandemic uh, to protect the safety of patients and also to deal with the significant health uh, uh, care implications of, of the pandemic i think now we're coming to the point where we're hoping very soon uh, these restrictions will be will be re relaxed somewhat. Uh, so we're preparing to restart with uh, with, with all due haste. Uh, so, but but we I think in the last year we've enrolled only one patient because of these restrictions. So uh, hopefully in July we'll be um, like, like many other studies we'll be able to get going much closer to full capacity and we'll be getting on our way to reaching our target. But so far what I can say is. Safety has been 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 very good. We've had absolutely no problems, nothing that would suggest a safety problem, and we've dosed. So we've provided uh, 51 uh, study product doses with uh, with no problems at all. So th th that's very encouraging. Um, there's another question, uh, Nathan. You, you were talking about the pH registry. There is another question about the number of pH patients that are there across Canada. Do, do we have a uh, uh, more precise idea of, of this? That's a very good question. So I, I can't give you an exact number. We haven't yet pooled the data, but we're getting in a state where we can definitely do that. I think that uh, 5,000 would be a good estimate, I, I think, uh, personally. Um, looking at our numbers, we have if the people in our registry in Vancouver, we have close to 1,000. I, I think that, that um, several i mean you know closer to a thousand than 500 so i think that across the country 5,000 would be a good estimate uh but hopefully we'll get to get uh someday to a day when there's zero but um you know that's uh that'll be in the future thank you nathan uh there's another question about the ongoing trial of e-nailed uh, nitric oxide in, in the u.s uh, are you aware of any of the of those studies ongoing in Canada uh, for pH? So just for just so I mean I'm not sure everybody's familiar with uh, long term based responders, but um, there is a very small subset of pH of idiopathic pH about 10 percent where pulmonary pressures um, virtually normalize uh, with nitric oxide uh, with vasodilators like nitric oxide, which is why. You know, myself and Dr. Mack, you know, when we're doing a initial right heart cath study in the cath lab with a new diagnosis of idiopathic PAH, it's it's routine that we will do um, a nitric oxide challenge in the cath lab. Um, this population does very well. You know, they um, they so long as they maintain their responsivity, they have an excellent prognosis. They often respond just to calcium channel blockers alone, um, because we're talking about a very small subset of idiopathic PAH, there really aren't many of them. I only have about a handful of patients um, who qualify for this in my, in my practice. They do very well, so a very tiny population. There aren't any clinical studies uh, involving um, vasoreactive nitric oxide responders 
that I'm aware of. But I think from a basic science perspective, trying to understand what makes them unique and trying to understand um, how they differ from from other patients with PAH um, is still an area of active investigation, but I can't point to a specific basic science trial that um, that's looking at it. I'm not sure whether Steve or Sebastian, whether you have any uh, any knowledge of anything. I don't know, Sebastian, if you want to come in on that or. Where is it, Steve? Well, I, um, uh, th there's an interest about um, nitric oxide for, for responders, but there's been also, also interest uh, using this treatment for non-responders as well. So especially um, uh, patients that are already, uh, because inhaled nitric oxide requires continuous um, uh, treatment with, with, with uh, uh, airflow with, with using nitric oxide. So. And there's been interest to to give that treatment to patients that were already on long-term oxygen therapy as well, including those who are non-responders as well. But I'm not aware of any Canadian sites uh, participating in that trial right now, personally. Okay, um, th there's also a question about, so Duncan was talking about genetics. Um, earlier and th there's a question about whether you know mutations uh, do uh, have any implication in terms of prognosis response to therapy respond uh, a better response to some therapies as compared to other therapies i don't know if you want to comment on that uh, duncan yeah so so uh, very good question um definitely um the um presence of mutation particularly the most common mutation the bone morphogenic protein receptor 2 mutation uh, does confer a um, more aggressive disease with a worse prognosis overall. So, so it uh, usually presents at a younger age, and 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 uh, and the survival is, is not as good. Um, in, in, so, I mean, there's there's value, I guess, in knowing that and and, and being aggressive about the therapy. Um, uh, the same may be true for other mutations, but there's less le less information uh, available because they're much more rare. Um, however, it may be that, uh, and again, we're not there yet, but um, uh, for instance, in patients that have that mutation, uh, you know, there may be a specific mechanism by which they, they, they develop their disease, an imbalance, for example, in terms of the signaling between different molecules like the BMPs and the TGF beta system. And, uh, and so there are currently some new therapies that are trying to rectify that. Uh, which are looking promising. I don't know, and maybe um, maybe others uh, on the panel would, uh, whether they've looked at any subgroup analyses and whether patients with mutations are more likely to respond to these or not. But again, as we get more experience, uh, my guess is that uh, much like cancer, the patients that do have a mutation or a genetic variant um, will, um, will respond differently to different medications, and there may be preferential ways of treating them. So Again, we're, we don't have all the information yet, but, uh, but I think in the next uh, 10 years, maybe five years, we'll, we'll be further along. But I think uh, it's, it's very likely that the mutations will help guide therapy. But, uh, but, uh, can I comment? Can, yeah, sure. Are, are we doing like systematic uh, genetic testing in, in Canada? Uh, I know they are doing it in France, in Paris. They are doing like genetic testing and, and same in Netherlands. They are doing genetic testing in a, every uh, single pH uh, patient, but I don't think we are doing this in Canada. I don't know whether Nathan wants to, to comment, but I mean, part of the reason is, is um, it carries with it this, this significant, um, hmm. uh, one has to manage the, uh, the consequences of doing genetic testing, certainly, uh, you know, it, um, especially when, when that genetic testing doesn't actually help us right now in terms of managing the disease. So uh, there's, uh, uh, there's need for genetic counseling, there's privacy concerns, there's uh, um, uh, there can be even financial concerns in terms of insurance and other things. So, so it's not, you know, so there are social and economic implications of doing that. So I'm not sure how they do it in, in France. You, you can, sometimes you can do it in such a way that you don't share the results so that you just use it, uh, it's just done to, inform the science, uh, but that has implications too. So I know certainly in our center, we've gone back and forth and uh, about about trying to do that uh, and participating in some of these uh, these larger uh, consortium, but uh, 
um, it's uh, there are some issues that you have to address. Um, mm. so, sorry, I was distracted by the by the chat a little bit. Um, could I hear the question again? So, so, so the, the the question from Sebastian was: um, Do you do you do systematic uh, genetic testing for your PAH patients? Um, so, so yes, for PAH we are uh, for idiopathic PAH we are. Uh, we have been selective, but we're we are we are expanding it. Um, over the past few years, we have been been doing it um, doing it more routinely. There's another question uh, on the chat about how the Canadian re registry works, uh, and patients ask whether they need to register themselves or through their pH center. So I don't know, Nathan, if you want to comment about how the registry works and what you can get out of it. Yeah, so, so looking at data is a, uh, a great way of, of knowing whether we are doing a good job of treating patients in pulmonary hypertension and learning from, from our experience. So we have uh, so many patients who, um, you know, who come in and, and we, we, we treat them with medications that we know work in terms of trials, but, but seeing how patients respond in the real world environment is very important. Um, so in participating sites, and most of the centers across the country are participating, th there's a consent process. So there is a consent um, letter that is provided often when you're first seen in the pulmonary prevention clinic uh, to um, they ask whether you, be, whether you would be willing to uh, have data arising from your, from your visits um, you know, incorporated in the registry and used for research and completely anonymized. So um, anything that could be used to identify you as as the, the person who the data was derived from is removed. Um, and what um, there are a few things that we're, we're hoping to look at across the country, you know, outcomes based on certain patient characteristics, you know, who um, is being well served. You know, um, recently in uh, British Columbia, we looked at at outcomes based on where you were in the province. You know, were you living far away from, from the center in Vancouver? Um, you were in a small area or a big area? We, we found that, that there really wasn't any difference in terms of outcomes or in terms of how we're treating you or in terms of how you're feeling at the last visit or in terms of how sick you were coming into your initial right heart cath. There wasn't any, any difference that we saw uh, and we took that to be very encouraging. Um, and we published that in a medical journal earlier on this year. Uh, so it's research like that that um, can help to to just let us know that we're doing the right thing. But again, participating participation in the registry is something that's done in the in a site that's participating through a consent process. Uh, and um, if, if you, I mean, certainly um, in terms of the actual form uh, and how to get involved, um, if you talk to your PH doctor, they'll be able to 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 give you the details. Th thank you, Nathan. Um... Uh, th there's also a question about, you know, COVID has brought up uh, very bad things over the last uh, 15 or 16 months, but do you suspect that th there will be some benefits that come out of this global pandemic in regards to uh, pH in terms of research, patient management, uh, treatment? So, uh Steve, I recently uh, I was approached by a group. Um, so, as you know, there is a, an element of COVID in which uh, uh, of a pulmonary arteriopathy in COVID disease. And there was a group that recently approached me about participating in um, uh, in some research to try and stress the pulmonary uh, vasculature in patients who have COVID long um, syndrome. Um, so, what I think. Is that, um, you know, when it actually relates to another question that Jamie asked um, about, you know, how many patients have pulmonary hypertension in general? And Nathan answered correctly, you know, if you consider all the WHO groups, there is a, a, a huge number of patients that actually have pulmonary hypertension, not perhaps pulmonary arterial hypertension, but what they share in common with PAH patients is they share um, morbidity, so they don't feel well. They share mortality. You know, it certainly increases the likelihood of, of not doing well. And they also, um, you know, share, unfortunately, the stress to the right ventricle, which is another huge area of research is to understand how to, um, 
to, to help the right ventricle be more resilient. <laughs> so one thing I was going to ask the rest of you is, um, you know, so when, when we are talking about pH specifically, all of the great work you guys are doing, I was curious about um, how you um, per maintain funding, you know, when, when it's a group of, uh, you know, when it's relatively small group, I'm sure you've heard this before, right? This is a relatively small group of patients, but there are, um, so COVID brings up an interesting um, opportunity, yes, uh, and other diseases in which pulmonary hypertension is a problem also bring up, you know, the generalizability of anything, any, any sort of research that studies really uh, the pulmonary the pulmonary vascular challenge to the right ventricle, you know, these are ways that we can enhance or um, increase our capacity to do research for several different diseases, including pulmonary arterial, that will benefit pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I did have like a little question for, for you both, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the group as to how they find the funding landscape uh, for their work, specifically in PAH. Um, out of curiosity. And I, I thought, Jamie, that your question was really important because, um, you know, if you look at an advanced heart failure population, which is another area where I do a lot of pH work, you know, over 70% of patients, particularly with the new definitions um, in advanced heart failure, have pulmonary hypertension, right? So there's a lot of potential um, and a lot of cross-fertilization, right, between different, uh, uh, different scientists in different areas. So I don't know who wants to ask, answer Susanna's question. Uh, <laughs> uh, funding is always a challenge, um, and you're, we always feel fortunate when we get uh, funding to do the work we want to do. Uh, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I think, as, as Sebastian said, there's a lot of interest in this area now. So, um, uh, and the biology is very exciting, and 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 you know the. So so I think that 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 helps. So it's a very topical area, um, but. Um, you know, uh, it's um, you're only as good as your last grant, I guess, and uh, so uh, you always you always go forward with some uh, some concerns about where are you going to get the funding from. But I think uh, the, the the best the best way to do it is to is to um, is to do good good research and to uh, uh, and to produce you know very good good solid uh, advances products uh, in terms of, um, of publications and so forth, and uh, and hopefully that helps you get funded. But Funding is always a challenge. I mean, maybe Sebastian or, or Steve want to comment. Uh, Sebastian certainly has been very successful uh, in this field. Well, thank you, Duncan. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know how to answer to that, but I think, uh, uh, again, like just Duncan said, there is a lot of similarities between pulmonary hypertension and many other diseases. So, you know, when you are competing for a grant and you are competing with cancer people, heart failure people, I think if you can sell that your ideas might benefit in addition to pulmonary hypertension to other, other type of diseases, I think this is critical. And I think we have evidence now, uh, especially uh, in the field of pulmonary hypertension, that we are benefiting from a cancer drug, for example, there is many trials using cancer, anti-cancer therapies to try to cure pulmonary hypertension. So there is evidences that pH and cancer might not be that different. So, you know, when you're applying to grants, you always to keep you in mind that, you know, what you're going to find in terms of biology or in terms of mechanistic or genetics or uh, molecular pathways and so on can benefit many other diseases than just uh, pulmonary hypertension. So this is one. The second, then, you know, you can always, um, as mentioned before, there is more and more uh, drug company investing money in pulmonary hypertension. And uh, uh, so more, uh, you know, maybe 20 years ago, we had only one, which was Actelion. And now we have like multiple of these uh, companies uh, supporting uh, research, uh, both preclinical and clinical research. So this is another way to get funded. Um, so there is a lot of ways, uh, like Duncan said, this is not easy, uh, you know, for, for myself, for example, I'm pretty sure that I'm applying to maybe 10 grants a year and I'm probably getting two of them out of the 10. This is, you know, but this is our, our life. I mean, <laughs> it's part of the job. So, 
you know you 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 are you are getting a lot of frustration when when you are starting your career with uh, and then you get used to it <laughs> so but you know th th thank you all i don't know if uh, nathan you wanted to add something or can move to uh... yeah, so i mean i'm uh, i'm i'm a clinician which uh, makes it a lot easier for me certainly um the sort of things that, that we've been doing at, at VGH are, are very clinical and don't cost a lot of money. Um, so, uh, but definitely uh, industry support it helps. Um, and, um, you know, research grants, um, small ones we've been applying for, uh, you know, um, it, um, it, it, I, I definitely would not say, I'd say that um, uh, the sort of stuff that we do is generally smaller scale and, and clinical and, and that makes it um, a little easier from a financial point of view. Thank you. We, we've been talking about uh, the work that is being done uh, by researchers, their teams, including pro professionals and, and students. But how do you see how pH patients can contribute to, to research? Uh, in which ways do you see patients contributing to, to research? Maybe I'll start. I mean, there's, there is a tremendous um, sort of uh, uh, in growth and interest and uh, in terms of uh, of having patients uh, participate in research not just as 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 uh, participants in the trial but also at every stage of research sort of advising uh, you know uh, uh, in the design of trials or even even about what kinds of, uh, of of trials should be done and then in 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 designing trials in particular endpoints uh, what are you know what are the endpoints that really matter and uh, and so this is this is something that is uh, is um, is increasing uh, progressively, and I think uh, uh, in, in in current trials and certainly in future trials, um, it, 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 having patients participate at all aspects of the design and the uh, and the uh, uh, execution of the trials is is really going to be necessary to to really make sure that we're we're designing the trials in appropriate fashion that we're choosing the right targets and and and, and that we have the right endpoints that are going to matter to to our patients. So. Uh, I think uh, we uh, like we're recognizing how, how important their contribution actually is. Any other comment from Susanna, Nita, and, and, and Sebastian? So I, I must say, well, I'm quite grateful to. So, in as you know, sort of my work is between Nathan and certainly. I'm not a basic scientist, um, and I don't have the type of laboratory program that, uh, that Duncan would. But I also, like Seb, I also apply for grants. and <laughs> I do have a clinical physiology program um, in which patients participate in, in studies, for example, doing exercise um, um, for me to study how the uh, heart responds and how the blood pressures, how the pulmonary pressures respond. And, you know, I always am struck by how um, willing patients um, are to participate. Um, so all I can really say about uh, patients in, 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 uh, in research is uh, I'm just grateful for their engagement. And you know, obviously, I understand why, but it's, it, I must say it really is. Um, I, I've had some amazing experiences with patients and their willingness to participate. And I definitely, I would agree. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, you know, we're grateful for all of the, uh, the help of research. Um, and um, it's how we learn. It's how we, we develop new therapies and develop new um, techniques and develop new, um, new care models. So it, it um, you know, it, I can't thank participants enough. And uh, if uh, definitely what I would do is approach your local team and, uh, and they can see if there's any studies that, that you would fit in um, and, um, as Duncan says, more and more, uh, we're realizing how integral it is to involve patients early on in the, in the design process. There was uh, something that Dr. Weatherald uh, had, um, was leading, um, asking about where our priorities should be in terms of, of, of research. And, um, and that, that's another example of, of how um, making sure that our research is tailored towards um, what, um, what patients want us to look at. Moi, je vais, je vais rajouter en français que nous, on est choyés au Québec. De... Well, we are blessed here in Quebec to have uh, uh, patients that push us every day and encourage us by their willingness to participate in our research to make that research go forward for uh, uh, PH. 
And so we're really blessed to, to have patients that are involved that much in the studies that encourage us, support us, and give us a, their bodies to better understand and to try to heal them and to uh, help uh, heal future uh, patients that are uh, touched by this uh, horrible uh, uh, disease. And I want to thank them in French for those of the Quebec, and I'm sure that Steve, uh, you're, you can join me in uh, thanking them. Yeah, yeah, obviously, without the help of those patients, uh, the research would be uh, quite limited. That is very clear. Um, is there any benefits, but also risk for pH patients to, to contribute or participate in clinical trials? Or, and what are the, the, the manners where, you know, that are you being used to protect uh, patients participating in, in trials? May, may I go first again? <laughs> um, that's again a very, very important question. So, you know, why participate in each, each patient must make that decision based on their own, uh, uh, their own circumstances, their own feelings, and and and, and the trial that they're being uh, be, being um, sort of uh, asked to participate in. Um, obviously, um, all these trials, uh, by and large, are, are 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 still experimental, so there's no guarantee that any of these. Uh, therapies, even though they may be very promising, will actually work. So uh, uh, there is no uh, not necessary not necessary true that uh, that patients will directly benefit from new therapy. However, if if that therapy is 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 uh, actually a, a successful therapy, then then they would have potentially been able to receive that uh, in, in advance of it becoming widely available. Um, you know, obviously, there uh, as Nathan said, I think the participation also is, is absolutely important as we go on this journey to try to find out the best way to manage uh, patients with this disease and, 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 and what therapies are better and what new therapies work. So uh, again, it's, it's an altruistic, I guess, uh, reason that, that, that your, your participation helps us understand better and, 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 and therefore make progress. Uh, and without that, we, we, we couldn't do progress. In terms of um, safeguards, I mean, there, there are a lot of safeguards. I mean, uh, every study has got to be looked at uh, uh, very carefully at different levels. So it's uh, mo all these studies would be regulated by the Health Canada. So they have to go through a very rigorous review that would look at uh, in great detail, much like any, you know, um, any, any, um, any uh, drug company trying to come forward with a new therapy. Uh, every aspect of the uh, of the product, how safe it is, all the elements and sort of components of that that that, that product, and and their safety uh, plus a, a critical appraisal of the of the clinical trial, making sure that it's also well designed and safe for patients. And and then of course, uh, in addition to that, all these trials have to undergo research ethics review uh, at each of the institutions. Uh, so there again, uh, this is often a, I think always a very detailed and very thorough process to make sure that. Uh, that uh, patients' interests are being safeguarded every step of the way. Um, so, so the hope is that those those safeguards are, are adequate, and that uh, and uh, you know it's really our responsibility to try to, at, at, at utmost, make sure that we 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 do no harm and and and, and we can uh, move through uh, and, and learn about the the uh, potential uh, um, effectiveness of new treatments in a way that that minimizes any risk to, to our patients. Steve, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Uh, another question related to funding. Um, do you think that the recent move by the federal government and other governments as well to reduce uh, the prices uh, for, for drugs will uh, end up uh, reducing funding from drug company to, uh, for research in Canada? Wow, that's that, that's a big question. I, it will, <laughs> you know, we'll, 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 time will tell. I mean, it's uh, it's the balancing act, uh, trying to keep costs down, manageable. New, new therapies are becoming so expensive. Uh, certainly in the cancer area, some of these therapies, uh, the CAR T therapy, for example, is it has has been been so so expensive that it's very hard to for provinces to provide that uh, to to patients. So so there there's a real issue or concern there. And on the other hand. Uh, 
uh, you know, drug companies um, uh, invest a lot of money in development of therapies that they want to make sure that they're able to uh, to be able to um, um, uh, benefit from pricing that allows them to uh, recoup those costs and, uh, and 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 of course they're mostly uh, the private sector obviously and they have uh, have investors and they're responsible to their investors in terms of profit so it's that dynamic right um, yes we're a pretty small player um, uh, you know I think I think you can achieve I'm not sure I'm not going to comment on 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 the on the current government's strategy and whether it's the best strategy but I I, I think you've got to work at that and and I think it's possible to achieve a balance at uh, social responsibility in terms of paying fair prices uh, but still providing the environment that will attract and uh, maintain uh, 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 private sector interest in, in, in Canada. Not easy. Thank you, perhaps a uh, quick question regarding, um, sir, any news on the implantable uh, pump being available in Canada anytime soon? So I don't know, uh, Nathan, if you're aware of, of, of uh, any development there. Yeah, so you're referring to the implantable troposinal pump, uh, I believe. Um, and I, I am not, there other than some discussions a couple of years ago, I, I don't think it's moved any further along. It's not that I'm aware of. Um, Duncan, have you heard anything else? Yeah, no, not not recently, but uh, yeah. So uh, I, I don't know the exact timeline, but hopefully uh, uh, that that will become available. It's um, it obviously would have a, a lot of uh, convenience and advantages for our patients. I can provide a brief update just to let folks okay. know that uh, although there have been there's been some movement in the states to providing FDA approval of the you know, not the pump itself, which has actually been in existence for a while now, but uh, but for this particular use uh, in this patient population. And so I think one, now, that, now that we're seeing some movement in, in the U.S., hopefully the company um, will be able to, to focus on other markets next. And, uh, and I know that, uh, that the company is working to, to, to investigate bringing it to Canada, um, but I think it also needs to be able to demonstrate that there's a need here. So I think if patients are interested in this particular form, of treatment administration, they need to speak with their with their healthcare teams so that their teams can uh, can be letting the company know that uh, that there's going to be people here who who want it and need it. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we have only a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to end up with one last question for the, our colleagues. Is you, you know the complexity of the disease, but is there any hope in your mind that pH will someday become a curable disease? And and if so, what makes you confident about that? So uh, I'll ask the four of you to answer that, that, uh, that question if possible. Okay, why don't I just say yes? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, but, but what makes you confident about that, Susanna? Well, I think that, uh, so, oh, I think that um, just to put it in context of, uh, so I am a, a heart failure physician. Um, so uh, disease with, um, you know, uh, that affects a, a large uh, population. Um, and I think that when I simply compare uh, the progress that's been made, actually, right, side by side for, for a condition with, um, you know, with the barriers of how small the population is, um, perhaps, uh, and so on. Yet the progress that's been made in 10 years has been uh, astounding. And, and certainly, I don't know if folks know, but, uh, you know, when I was a trainee, Dr. Stewart was, uh, had just come to Toronto. And just um, the work that has happened, you know, when you watch uh, somebody like, uh, like him, like yourself, uh, except, and the work that's been done in terms of understanding uh, the condition and how far we've come, um, you know, there's there's obviously, and, and Nathan said it at the beginning that he's really optimistic, hopeful. He's seen so much, um, so so much development and change. Um, the speed at which that's happened has been incredible over the last few years. Though, you know, I think that we've already talked a lot about the fact of, about the other things we would need to make progress, right? So I think early detection and biomarkers, as Duncan said, would be a huge barrier that we need to get get through. But I have hope. Yeah, I, I'd like to echo that. Uh, so I, I am a, an optimist at heart. Um, but even, even then, I mean, when you look at, at the 
the curves that you showed earlier in your presentation, Steve, you look at where we came from, you know, 40 years ago and we had nothing at all to a situation now where we have 10 drugs available. We, you know, we start early. We, we, we've definitely have changed the disease course. Um, you know, irrefutably, we, we've uh, changed the disease course. Um, I, I, there will be a day when it's curable. It, it may not be everything at once. It probably won't be everything at once. It'll be little bits once we identify what particular genes are responsible for which part of PAH and, and uh, hopefully be able to target them one by one. But I, um, I think what we'll see is ongoing progress. And I would, I, I, I definitely hold up a lot of hope that someday, maybe not, maybe not in our lifetime, but, but someday when, uh, you know, people can, can, you know, not have to come and see me in clinic and, and uh, we can, uh, we can focus on other things. Duncan. I, I would agree. Uh, I, I think, uh, again, I tend to be an optimist, but I think if you just, and the reason I think it's going to be, um, uh, curable or at least preventable, um, uh, maybe both, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're really, you know, we're, we're beginning to um, develop uh, exponential increase in our understanding of the disease and the technologies that are available both to understand the biology as well as the treatment uh, uh, of it are really developing in leaps and bounds. So, so um, you know, I think, uh, I think the, the, uh, there's every reason to believe that at some point, uh, we will have be, be able to master this, this challenging problem. Thank you, Sebastian. Well, of course, if you don't believe in what you do, you should simply stop doing it. So, of course, that we're going to cure it. It's, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time. And, and you know, if you look at the research uh, community, what we have done with COVID-19 in, within one year, we, we have been able to develop a vaccine. Uh, so just a matter of putting, you know, working all together toward the same direction, and I'm I'm sure we're going to cure it at some point. So, uh, you know, it's like sport. If you don't believe that you can win, just stop. <laughs> so I think the, the question is like, nobody can say no. <laughs> so, so that last comment was about the Canadians in the playoffs? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well... You know, if you watched the game last night. Yeah, yeah this is good. Yeah, you've got to believe. You've got to yeah. believe. I mean, <laughs> they only so, had 10 shots and they won the game in overtime. I mean. So on that, uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists. It's, it, the time is now over. Merci à tous les panelistes et tous les participants à cette, uh, cette réunion-là. It was a pleasure to thank all speakers. Hopefully you enjoyed the session. So again, I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye bye all. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Go Habs. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Hey. So, so we thank are out of so stage. You. Okay. Right, you <laughs> you are still on stage. You are. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye. Thank You're you welcome. So thank you, Steve. Bye bye everybody. <laughs> bye bye. All right, take it away, Nicole. I think you're on on mute, Nicole. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, quelle discussion extraordinaire uh, et de la part de tout le monde ici. What an extraordinary discussion, and for everyone, uh, including uh, people who came uh, later, I really. Thank you, especially Dr. Provenche, for having been our moderator today. Dr. Bonet, Dr. Bruner, Dr. Mack, and Dr. Stewart for taking the time to be here and sharing their excitement with us about the future of pH treatments in Canada. Uh, there's amazing research uh, happening in this country, and as a patient, it gives me and I'm sure so many others hope for the future. And I know patients are, are can be sometimes impatient and they want to know uh, the answer quickly as to what kind of new things are going to happen. And that was my question actually about the implantable pump because uh, having so many issues with, um, uh, you know, having... Um, a Hickman in my chest, you know, this, this is always something that's on my mind and other, other friends who, who have issues as well. So again, for those who don't know me, and if you don't know me, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible. 
my name is Nicole Dempsey and I'm the chair of PHA Canada's board of directors. Um, Jamie, our executive director, and I have a few closing comments uh, for you as we bring this extraordinary week to a close. Hard to believe it's been a week already. Um, so first, we just need to thank our sponsors. Uh, we have the gold sponsors, Janssen and United Therapeutic Corporation. Our silver sponsor is Acceleron. Bronze is Bayer. Uh, we have a contributing sponsor, Shoppers Drug Mart Specialty Health. Network and our in-kind sponsors, La Fondation HTAPQ, uh, Love Light Reiki, and Mantis Yoga. So we just want to thank you all for your important contributions to our first ever virtual conference. Uh, this week has been full of learning, connection, reflection, and play. And we thank you generously for supporting our, our little PH community and giving us the extraordinary opportunity to grow together. Next, uh, we need absolutely and want to acknowledge and thank the many volunteers that made this week possible. Uh, first, to our dozens of speakers and session hosts, thank you. Um, you know, I appreciated everyone who worked diligently at running this this uh, event. Um, you know, I could never imagine what this would have been like. It's my first virtual event, and I think. I'm, I'm probably not alone in saying that many thought this, this went um, exceptionally well. And I'm really proud of everyone who, who got this and pulled this together. Um, something that I always appreciate um, being a patient are the Mythbuster um, Q and A's with doctors and nurses. And it's, all, it's always a favorite. And, and I think we, we've realized in the past that they are our favorites of patients. Um, and caregivers, even at the in-person conferences. Um, I'm always thankful for docs and nurses who take time to be part of these sessions, and I'm always impressed. And uh, one day at the, one of the question, uh, one of the myth, myth busters, there was actually a full panel of docs that really spanned across the our country. You know, we had one from New Brunswick, one from BC, one from uh, Winnipeg, Toronto, Quebec. It, it, it's really impressive. Um, Lastly, I think I'd be remiss if I did not mention uh, the fantastic event that we had last night. It was our, um, well, let's say it was our talent slash open mic slash, slash mishmash event um, um, hosted by our own Jane. Um, and I mean, it, 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 you know, it was an hour of just fun diversion and just let's just forget things for, for one hour. So. Thank you so much, Jane, for that. On to you. All right. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Next up in the thank yous, we really, really want to thank our conference organizing committee. Thank you to all of you for putting together such an amazing week. You know, when we started, we really wanted to somehow replicate some of that fun and connection that makes coming to conference so special. We really wanted this week to be more than just a series of webinars. And thanks to your great ideas, your insights, recommendations, and never ending support, this week has truly exceeded my expectations. You know, we set out to create something that was more than just another Zoom meeting, we kept saying, and I believe we really succeeded. You know, from the many intimate conversations that took place throughout the week to the utter joy of last night's show, this was a week that was more than just research updates and practical tips for living with pH. It really was about making connections and being part of a strong, united community. You know, it's always astounded me how united the PH community is, how truly connected you are to one another. And this week, you embraced all the newness and all the challenging technology to be together, and it was really extraordinary. So for instance, how cool is it that today we get to celebrate the birthdays of two of our very own PHers out there? We've got Diane Curl having a birthday today, and Joanne Mainwood in Ottawa. So Diane in Vancouver, happy birthday, and Joanne in Ottawa, happy birthday from all of us. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday, girls. And, you know, it got me thinking how someone once commented, and I, I don't know where this was or where we were, um, and they, they commented on how PHA Canada's community was so um, tight 
and how they had never seen another organization like ours. And I, I took that as a really great compliment. And I always found the same. And not that I have very much experience with other uh, patient organizations, but I, I had to agree. So it really was a fantastic week. And I think it truly defined our theme being extraordinary together. Um, I, I mean, we were all together in some way or another. And um, yeah, I just think it really encapsulated that theme. Um, so just a few little housekeeping things um, as, as we <clears throat> wrap up today. Um, don't forget about our PHA store, or our PH store. Uh, you get 15% off until the end of the month with the code 2021 conference. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The conference website will be available to all the registered participants until the end of August. Uh, session recordings will be added to the program as they become available. And you'll be able to continue to view the exhibits and participate in group discussions, just in case you haven't had um, those opportunities. Um, also, please make sure you rate the sessions you attended if you haven't done so. Uh, you can go to the session in the program and scroll to the feedback survey at the bottom and click um, to enter your feedback. And on Monday, we'll also be sending you an evaluation survey for the entire conference. We encourage you to please take a couple of minutes to let us know what you thought about the whole conference experience. We look forward to learning from your feedback, of course, and um, obviously we always look look for ways to, to improve the next time, whether it be another virtual <laughs> conference, which I hope not, even though this went really well. Hopefully we can see each other in person. Um, and also watch this week for an announcement for the prize winners uh, from last Saturday's opening icebreaker. So we'll make the announcement as soon as we can figure out how to run a list of the many people who attended. Our team has learned a lot of new things recently. A lot of techie stuff. <laughs> Yes, everybody has been learning. We've all been learning together. And so I just really want to take this opportunity one last time. One of the best parts of conferences is, of course, getting to, uh, for the team, is getting to spend time with all of you, to meet all of you, and to spend time with the leaders of our organization. So we're going to take a little moment here to uh, to bring up our PJ Canada staff team so that you can all see them and get quickly introduced to them. The team is very new, but they just jumped right in this week. Uh, to help make this week's success. So we're gonna bring them all out here so that you can uh, get introduced if you haven't already. We've got Darren, here comes Samantha and Malena. Ashok, where are you? Are you out there, buddy? Come join us. Anyway, all right, well, while we wait for Ashok, I'll just ask everybody here. I'm not gonna, we don't have much time, so I'm not gonna go around. We've got Darren, our new manager of strategic initiatives, soon to be coming to you from Toronto. Just give him a couple, I don't know, like a week and a half to get there and uh, and he'll be your your your, your, your Toronto-based uh, PHA Canada per person. And then we've got Malena, our new bilingual marketing and communications coordinator, who is a, a Montrealer at heart, but lives in Calgary. And uh, then we have Samantha Gordon with us from St. John, New Brunswick. Samantha is one of our two summer students. She is a research assistant who's going to be specifically helping to analyze all that yummy data that you guys have been giving us through the PH National or the National PH Community Survey. So I just really wanted to take this opportunity to commend the staff for all their hard work this week, uh, not just this week, but really in the weeks leading up to this. It's very difficult to come into a, an organization that you're brand new to, to a community you don't know and have to execute a conference in a virtual way for the first time ever. So I just really, really appreciate all the hard work you've all done. Please feel free to unmute yourselves and just say hi to everybody. And, uh, and uh, thank you all for such a great, mm -hmm. uh, a great week this week. Thank you for teaching me so much this week from not only the docs, but the patients who speakers and giving up your time and energy. And um, yeah, it was an amazing week. They're giving you guys a round of applause. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. We're going to ask you to go back out into the audience. And then we've got one more special group of people that I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to. They are the board of directors and your ambassadors. 
The board of directors are your leaders that really set the overall strategic objectives and direction of PHI Canada. And they ensure that what we're doing is, is everything that we can possibly do to achieve our mission of creating a better life for all of you. So we're gonna quickly introduce you to our board of directors, but I also wanna take this opportunity to introduce you to your ambassadors. Um, uh, the ambassadors are the leaders who like your board are really focused on that mission and the vision of PHA Canada and are working with us every day to make sure that we're accomplishing it in a way that is going to be the best for you. They represent your voice every day. They help me uh, understand the issues that we're facing and to do the work that we're doing. So I'm going to invite um, Ed and Jeanette and Emily and Sanjay, I see is here. Thank you. As well as Joan, Sonia, Beth and Nicole to please come and join us and say hello to this community that you guys serve every single day. Um, and just, I, I just want to thank you all so much for the support that you give me and to the team. So here we go. Sanjay, nobody needs to be introduced to you. One of our founders, our eternal friend and uh, forever champion of the PH community, Sanjay, welcome. We've also got Jeanette Reyes, our nurse practitioner from Sick Kids, who um, has been on the board now for a few years. Emily Pinkard, also in Toronto, welcome, Emily. And uh, Ed, I thought you were out there, but perhaps we've uh, we've missed you. But uh, Ed Rathoni, also from uh, also on the board of directors, his uh, out here in Vancouver. We've got a couple people who weren't able to be with us today. Uh, Dr. Lisa Melnichuk was with us earlier today. She is, uh, she's also one of our vice chairs along with Ed. We've got our treasurer, John Pettifor, who just had a baby recently and I'm sure is uh, busy snuggling her right now or, you know, changing a diaper, one of the two. And finally, um, Michael Roback, who many of you know because he was with us uh, as a staff member for a while and has now returned to the organization as one of our board directors. So welcome to our board members and then also to our fabulous ambassadors. We've got Beth out there in Halifax representing the East Coast. Sonia is her fellow East Coaster um, ambassador. And then we've got Joan Pollan from Ontario, from the Toronto area. And Jazz, I thought you were with us too, but nobody needs to be introduced to Jazz. Um, Jazz is our other ambassador out here in the West Coast. I just really wanted to acknowledge all the hard work that these folks give every single day um, to just really make sure that PHI Canada can be the best organization possible. And I also wanted to say that if any of you out there want to see yourself amongst this group of people, um, all you have to do is let us know. Um, we have, uh, we are always looking for, for more ambassadors and in particular right now we've got some needs in Quebec and in the Prairie region. So we're always looking for more people to join our ambassador team and uh, the board of directors has a little bit of room on it too. So for those who want to um, really maybe step up your involvement and get involved on more of a leadership level and to work with all of these fabulous people, I encourage you to, uh, to let me know. All right. Anybody want to say anything while I've got you? <laughs> Just a jazz. Jazz, where's your purple? Look around. Wait, I'm very... sick. Oh, the poor jazz. Oh, cool. had a busy week. Really oh. Oh. Yeah. Second one. Oh, oh her, it's her still. vaccine. Okay, well, you'll be over it in a couple of days. I'll be so. over it. PHN next is going to create purple pajamas just for you, Jazz. <laughs> Excellent. He's going to tell idea. me. He's going to tell me that it's a fundraiser in a second. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the good thing is, I was able to attend still, right? Yeah. 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 That's great. Because you can be sick and still come. Ah, <laughs> uh, the blessings, the blessings that we have. All right, everybody. Well, I don't want to keep everybody too long. I just really want to take the opportunity to acknowledge you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Out into the Thank audience. You. And then just a couple of final closing words. All right, back over to you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, it's time to say goodbye. All good things must come to an end, I guess. Uh, so the story goes. So again, thank you so much for being part of this, uh, our very first virtual conference. It won't be our last uh, gathering together, um, that's for sure. Um, we'll hopefully be in person the next time. We appreciate you guys sticking by us through, through everything and uh, as we tried new things. And you really, really are extraordinary. Thank you.
Yes. And thank you, Nicole, for being my uh, my partner in crime this week. I really appreciate all the support that you've given. Thank you to everyone out there. It really has been a wonderful week and it has been so nice to see your faces. As Jazz has reminded me, it's been very nice to be able to see you all uh, without your masks. <laughs> uh, I do have three very brief but very important parting messages for you. First and foremost, Happy Father's Day to all the dads and other father figures out there. I can tell you that Jesse's been putting in a little bit of overtime here. Uh, Sadie is now sleeping, I, or else I would bring her out to say hello to you all, but thankfully she's napping right now. So anyway, happy Father's Day to all of you. And then second, I wanted to wish a very happy pride to my beautiful queer family. Uh, in Vancouver, we don't march until August, so we get to celebrate pride all summer long. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge that June is Indigenous History Month and that Monday is Indigenous People's Day. I personally am very honored and very privileged to get to live on the lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. And I do hope that as settlers, immigrants, newcomers to this country, we will all take time to learn a little bit about the peoples and the nations that have been here since time immemorial and, uh, and just learn a little bit about not only their history, but of the many valuable contributions that they are making to our local communities today. So with all of those things happening, I hope you have something to look forward to after today's session throughout this weekend and throughout the rest of the month. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, we appreciate you so much. I hope your week has been as extraordinary as mine. Have a wonderful summer, everybody. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>